Hi, and welcome to the MimeCast. I'm Michael Gene Sullivan, and the MimeCast is a chance for uh, you, the audience, or anybody who's interested, a chance to kind of get to know Mime Troopers a little bit better, not just from the shows, but who we are as people. And Mime Troopers meaning veterans, collective members, current members, designers, people who've maybe not been with the company for decades, and some who just left, and some who are here right to now. So we want to have a chance for you guys to get to know us outside of this, who made us who we are. And so today, uh, we have a, a Mime Troop veteran, uh, ex-collective member, now off doing film and television and and theater around the country. Um, Ex-Mime Trooper, actor, director, Ugo Carbajal. So, How you doing? Yay, woo! Happy to Welcome be here. Welcome to the cast. Thank you. So, like I said, in trying to get to know folks, it's really starting from the beginning. So tell me about yourself. Where are you from? Where were you born? I was born in Juarez, Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, Mexico. Mm, mm -hmm. uh, and I was there throughout my childhood up until I was like 10 years old. And then no. migrated to Denver. My mother had already moved to Denver a year prior and she just... Uh, kept us with my aunt there for, for a little bit and then and then I moved once she was settled um, and you got and you knew you were gonna you, you didn't feel like oh mom's left you kind of knew and you were just waiting oh it was a big her. surprise actually her her moving really? to the states happened overnight I had no idea she was doing it one morning I wake up and she's gone and my aunt is like you're staying with us now um Oh my goodness. And actually the, I got the timeline wrong. That was seven years old. She wanted uh -huh. me to finish uh, my, my, my school year and then sent for me. I spent a year in Denver and then I, w I had to go back to Mexico for two years because we got uh, busted by CPS and threatened to be taken away from her because she was working three jobs and I was uh, babysitting my, my little brother. And so she got really scared, so she sent us back for two years, and then I finally came back and stayed when I was 10 years old. Wow. Yeah. So when, when she left, why did she leave so quickly? Why was it like, okay, I got to go now? Well, it, it was a very uh, spur-of-the-moment thing. One of her cousins was moving to Colorado to, to pursue work and to, and, and to do construction because there was a lot of construction happening up in the, in the skiing sections. And so he on a whim just said, do you want to come with me? And my mother was 20-something, didn't really <laughs> think about it much, and said, let's do it. And so she, she moved to Denver. Um, I mean, clearly she was not very happy with the work she was doing in Juarez because it was very, very hard backbreaking and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and then come to find out she comes to the States and she's still doing backbreaking work for decades after that, so... You know, right. sometimes the the United States is painted to immigrants as this amazing place, and so they come here and they f and they find that it's a lot harder than just showing up and finding a white picket fence. Yeah. Right. So, so uh, what was it like for you? As you know, you know, so you move here, move to Denver when you're seven, and you kind. Of, how, how long were you in Denver before you had to move back to Mexico? Uh, just one year. Just so a year here, then back. Yeah, so that's kind third, of third grade. So yeah, I'm spending third grade in Denver, learning the language. Um, great teachers, like they they would, they had this program where they would pull me aside from class and they would do just English focused uh, uh, lessons, and then then they 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 would reintroduce me back into the regular classroom. Um, Wow. Part of the day. So you learned, and uh, did you know any English before you came? None. None whatsoever. But as, oh, as, well, at least you were young, so it's, your brain was still at that yeah, squeezy point. As a kid, you were like a sponge. You just absorb things. And so I, I learned yeah. it fast, and I, and I was able to get around, especially because my mother needed me to translate for her. So I would, in the best oh. way possible, I would translate for her. So that, that made me learn it even faster. Um, and so... Yeah, and then fourth and fifth grade, I went back to Mexico 
And then for sixth grade, I came back, and that's when I stayed through through college. And now, hmm. Well, what was it like when you went? I'm, it's just really interesting to me that you know being here for the year and then going back. What was that? Uh, how did that feel? And uh, you know, and seeing any differences? Um, well, it's definitely a culture shock. Um, mm -hmm. And then. Missing a whole grade in Mexico affected me big time just because it moves at a very different pace than it does here in the States. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, third grade here is very different than third grade in Mexico. And so mm -hmm. there was a lot of adapting that I had to do, either learning things again when I came here or learning things again when I went there. It's, it's just not the right. same. Curriculum. Um, so that was definitely a challenge. But language wise, it was great. Because uh, I yeah. went back knowing English um, and made my Saturday morning cartoons much more enjoyable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so so now uh, so so you you grew up in Denver then after that, and were you in Denver? Uh, um, and you were into Denver up till college. I was in Denver all the way through my my graduate school. Um, oh wow. I, I finished graduate school in London, but the school was through Naropa University in Boulder. So I have a master's in physical mm -hmm. um, that I completed there. So when you were in, uh, so you're uh, in Denver and like, when did you start focusing on theater? Was that something that started in high school and then into college or was it once you were in college? It started in high school, started as a dare. Somebody dared me to audition for a show just because I was always acting out or acting a fool more so. Uh -huh. So I auditioned for it and I didn't get it. I didn't get it. But at the time I had a pretty tumultuous uh, home situation with a uh, stepfather mm -hmm. who was not very good to us. And so uh, I just didn't want to be home. So mm -hmm. any excuse for me to stay at school longer was great, you know what I mean? So and, and off the streets. So yeah, yeah. so. Uh, the director said, would you be willing to assist me? And so I, I decided to, to assist him. And so I was helping him out, getting that the point of view from the director, which was really great because it helped yeah. me in my development later on. And a week before opening, one of the actors just stops showing up and drops out. Oh, God. <laughs> And so I'm I'm filling in with the lines while the, try to, while the director tries to find somebody else. And eventually, he just slaps a costume on me and throws me on stage. And next thing I know, yeah. I'm opening as the narrator of Into the Woods. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. And oh, my goodness. Like, th that, could, that could either deter me from theater for the rest of my life or it's what, what it got me hooked. You know, the, you have to think on a dime. You have to make things happen. You have to get creative. And the show must go on. And that, that's kind of the And that idea. wasn't your thing at all. You were not even thinking about performing at that point? No, I was I was thinking about becoming a pilot or joining the Air Force and Oh really? Yeah, yeah. Um I was pretty good at math and so I was really sort of focused on that in that direction. I wasn't even hmm. arts arts based at all. Um not at all. Huh. So the dare, who was it that dared you? Was it a friend or? It was a friend of mine. Unfortunately, I don't remember his name anymore. Uh, I wish I could, but I really don't. Um, but yeah, he he's like, there's this audition tonight. You, sh you should do it. I dare you. And I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, I double dare you. You know, once you double dare a high schooler, yeah. it's, it's got to happen. Um, and wow. so I did. And and yeah, and that's that's how, after that, I completely shifted focus and did every single play the rest of my senior year because that was my junior really? year. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I guess, you know, I was pretty energized. So the, the, the drama teacher was like, yes, we'll put you on. Yes, we'll put you on. I mean, I did like three different plays that year. Wow. And then I, pursued it in college. So when you went to college, were you a drama major at that point? I was acting, directing major. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so then you said you so you did, you did undergrad here and then graduate school in London. Yes, I did undergrad at CU Denver, um, mm -hmm. 
it took me a long time just simply because I was also working full time. I was trying to manage my mother's mortgage at the mm. time because she, she had to leave in order to be able to be done with that guy that she was with. So right. she, left, she left town with my brother and sister and asked me if I could take care of her mortgage while she was gone. And so there I am in college trying to get my degree, trying to work full time so I can pay the mortgage and, and get my education. So that took me about six to seven years to finish undergrad. Uh, mm-hmm. Just several, a, a couple of times went into uh, academic um, probation. Um, just because of my mind was like trying to focus on too many things. I think mm-hmm. if, I, if I could go back, I would, I would just focus on work and then go back to school eventually, you know what I mean? But at the time, mm-hmm. I... I could do it all. I found myself in business. Trying to do everything at once. Yeah. Yeah. And so maybe that's huh. maybe that's what led to the hair loss. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think about that when I'm I, there was a while there where I realized that every time I directed a show my hair went whiter. <laughs> and I was like, man, I can't and then it was just like it just and then it was like, okay, every time I write a show, if I'm acting in a show, it's so much calmer. But it doesn't mean that the hair comes back. So it's like, damn. Once it goes and gray. Unlike it goes black, out, I'm assuming yeah. I have a particularly bizarre looking bald head. So I'm not gonna You're not I'm not sure. going there. It's not gonna make me look distinguished. I'm just gonna look cold. <laughs> um, so so you're in school and you're working with your uh, 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 what now what kind of work were you doing in trying to help your mother? I was customer service at a electronics company called Ultimate Electronics. It was mm. it was a regional company that kind of competed with Best Buy at the time mm-hmm. and with Circuit City, um, sort of similar. Um, yeah. And then I quickly made it to, to customer service manager within six months, mm-hmm. uh, which allowed me to get earn a little bit more, but it was also more stress. Um, yeah. And then finally, in 2002, graduated from college. By this point, my mother had come back and taken back her mortgage, which was great. Oh, uh, great. Yeah. Yeah. At this point, she had, uh, you know, was done with that guy, was with her new uh, who knew man, who is now her husband, and they've been together ever since. And mm-hmm. He's amazing. Great guy. <laughs> oh, cool. Now, how, how did she feel about the whole acting thing? Was it okay? Did she like whatever you want to do? At first, she didn't understand it. She's like, what? Like, it was just not something that we did. As a family, we never went to see theater. We, it was just not part of our lives, you know? So it was definitely confusing as to what it was about. But then once she started seeing me perform, she was like, okay, I'm with you. And oh, that's nice. Totally supportive. Mm-hmm. I think she just saw how much fun I had and how much I enjoyed it. You know what I mean? And so, but at first it was a struggle for her because you know she she's an immigrant and for her she's she's like, is this gonna pay the bills? And you know I cross the country for to better your life. You now you get that speech for a little bit, but then she she got over it eventually. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I'm sure it could be super scary. For the parents who are like, we've gone through all of this, like you said, and now you're throwing it away. Yeah, to be an artist. To be Uh, an artist. (laughs) And so, yeah, you, but, you know, if if the parent really cares about you and they see, like you said, she sees you and she sees how much fun you're having and she sees how, how it's, it's kind of like, this is who you really are and that she supported you and that is great. Yeah, exactly. So with grad school, how did that come about? Was it through your college, you know, or did different grad school that then sent you to London or what? Grad school landed, landed on my lap by very serendipitously. Um, I was going to be done with school because, you know, like I said, I, I, I didn't, did undergrad for seven years. So I was just like, I'm done. I don't want any more school. And so mm-hmm. during the last last semester, um, 
actually, let me backtrack. During the last years before I graduated, I started working with a theater company in Denver called Suteatro. And they're, uh, they're a Chicano-based company, one of the third oldest Chicano companies in the country. Oh, wow. And that's essentially where I found my footing as, a, as an actor. Like, that's where I, I was like, oh, these stories are my stories and I can actually get behind them because... In college, my experience was like, even though I was being cast, I was getting like terrible stereotypical roles. Mm -hmm. They were not necessarily challenging me to grow. They were just like, let's just get you through it and then, you know, you're good. And so it wasn't until I started doing work with Su Teatro that started as an internship for me and then it just became my work. So then I, I left um, I left the, the customer service job and then I just focused on working with them. And with them, I was technical director, I was director, I was actor, fundraiser, like I, everything that would you you would need to do for a nonprofit company I was doing mm -hmm. air, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, right. And so anyway, so one day, one of my fellow actors in the company was going to audition for the Denver Center, right? Mm. And and they had to create a series of characters. And so I led like an impromptu workshop with for him and like five of his peers on on just character creation, on just physical character creation, right? Very impromptu, very last minute, like, yeah, well, let's throw it together. Let's come up with some characters and let's see what happens. And part of that group, there was a young lady who was going to be the administrative assistant for this new training at Naropa. And it was all Lecoq-based training. Mm -hmm. uh, Lecoq is, wow. you know, physical theater. Um, Jacques Lecoq started this amazing school in France that is renowned and is still around today and people from all over the world go to train there. And so two of the people that were trained by him and were teachers at his school were starting their own program here in the States based on that wow. training. Mm -hmm. And and so she said, you would really get with this. Like this, this is right, to, right up your alley. And I had never heard of it before, so I said, Okay, and so she told me of a workshop that was going to be coming up in a couple of weeks that I attended, and I tell you, that got me so hooked. It was a one-week workshop, super intense mask, mask it. I think it was called like the evolution of mask or something like that. And hmm. each day we, we explored a different mask um, from, from the expressive mask to the larval mask to the half mask to the nose to just the mask on the nose, the clown, and all within a week. And it was led by this amazing teacher named Thomas Pratke, who just had a, a way with, with teaching that, that I'd never experienced before, like with any of my acting teachers, or he just knew exactly what to say to you based on whatever you were struggling at that time. Cool. He, he would shred you to pieces and then piece you back up like in a matter of a few sentences, you know what I mean? And there was something about that that just made me go, ah, okay. All right, I want to pursue, the, pursue this further. And so then I had, the, I had the option to take it just as a certificate program, right? Mm -hmm. Or to get my master's in it, which would be five times more expensive. Uh, <laughs> right, yeah. But at the time, I'm like, I... I wasn't 100% confident that I would be able to make a career out of acting, so I just wanted to have some sort of fallback plan. Mm -hmm. So I figured having a master's would allow me to, you know, at least teach. Right. And, and so that's why I, I decided to make the investment and pursue it as a master's. And though I regretted it for 10 years after that. <laughs> just because uh, of the money or? Yeah. It's it's finally starting to pay off, you know what I mean, now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but at the time, I'm like, why did I do this? When my when my, my peers who had done it for just certificate, they're like, cool, I'm done, paid my $3,000, I'm set. 
we got the same training. Right. Only difference was I I was you know getting a degree. Um, yeah. Did they? Did the? Uh, uh, so when did? How did London come into it? And did they all go, or was that something that was separate for the people who were going for the degree? Yeah, I was about to get into that. Um, so a third into our first year of the training, like almost in, almost into the last last quarter of it. Uh, our teachers sit us down and say, hey, so we have this opportunity to create a brand new school in London. It would wow. be myself. It would be the two of us, you know, opening the school and teaching it. Um, but I've made a commitment to you and, and, your, and your degree. So you have the option that we can stay here another year and I can finish my commitment to you and your training. Right. Or you can all come with us and finish your second year in London. Wow. Only based on the certification laws or whatever rules they had at the time, we all had to agree unanimously on it. Otherwise, huh. we would not be able to do it. Okay. At least that's, that's how it was explained to us. And so they took us all each and separately into each room so we can give our vote. And apparently everybody said yes, because next, next semester we were getting prepped to go to London. And now... Wow. According to those rules, we also couldn't. We had to do more than fifty percent of our of our credits in the states for it to qualify for for the for the program. So I had to continue training over the summer so that I can have just a little bit over fifty percent of my credits in the states. Right. So then I can pursue the rest of them in London. And hmm. so they started the. London International School of Performing Arts, otherwise known as LISPA. Wow. That is now no more. Um, they they moved the school. LISPA moved to Germany like after I left. And now mm. it's, it's it has a different name. Still same yeah. teacher, um, just different different name. Oh, I think it's, that's it's tough. Art House, written in German. Art House is what it's called. Art House. Yes. <laughs> but anyway, um, that was the quintessential year for me in terms of my training, because I got to go to a country that I was not familiar with, train in this program that was going to like just shred me to pieces and, and, and hopefully rebuild me, right? Um, yeah, everything, really. everything I thought I knew about theater just pretty much went out the window and I had to relearn it, right? Uh, but the program was called Actor Created Physical Theater, with the mm. focus that we, the actors, create the theater, which made me feel more like I can take ownership of the work that I was doing as opposed to just uh, interpreting. Right. You know what I mean? So now, now that the playwright has done his job, then it's my job to then create and add more layers to that. And before mm -hmm. that, my, my psyche was like, I have to honor these words 100% and only say the words. And it's yeah. like the words that it works, right? And yeah, yeah. it's always, it's a, it's a weird trying to find that balance. You know, as an actor, you're like, I've got these ideas, but am I being self indulgent? Yeah. You know, am I making something that the playwright or the director is going to be struggling with? And I've worked with actors who always bring new and fresh ideas. And you go, this is great. But I've also I've worked with actors as a playwright and as a director who they have an idea and you don't want to squash it. But it's a terrible idea. <laughs> it's an idea that has nothing to do with the script whatsoever. But it's something that that it's a way they're connecting to it. And it's like trying to find a way where they can have that connection. But uh, and, and not you know, not to squash their idea, not to destroy their, their ingenuity and their creativity, but to keep it in line. And it's something that it sounds like this program is very focused on. It's like knowing that what you're getting is from the script and then you are blossoming it out. You know, the script is the seed. Everything is in there. But to try to physicalize it and make it your own without making it something else. Yeah, well, the script barely came into play. Uh, most of it, most of it was just creating. In fact, words were hardly ever a thing in this in this training mm -hmm. uh, until we got to com comedia. Then we mm -hmm. started 
exploring how words sort of fall into this world. But before that, it was just sounds and body and body stories. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Lecoq, Lecoq refers it as poetic poetics of the body. You know, like the body is is, is a poet itself. And hmm. so, what stories can we tell before the words even come into play? Mm -hmm. With our, just our physical presence and our physical entrance, right? Um, yeah. And that's and that's kind of it has, has been the my approach to my work. It's just like, how much can I tell you before I even utter a word, right? Mm -hmm. And then once the words come in, how much more can I add to that within within you know obviously within the parameters of the story and honoring right. the story. Um, but still, it's it, I guess then it's more like like when you guys said you got to Canada. Mm -hmm. And like at the mime trip working in comedia and melodrama, that stuff where when the character enters, before they said anything, who are they? And so that the audience, it, it, it then is a relief in a way to both the writer, the director, and the author that, uh, and the actors that so much is done yeah. visually. And it's something that we lose nowadays when people are doing stage acting, but they're kind of trying to do film acting on stage. <laughs> yeah. Well, I also find it helpful. Like, I mean, I've I've been auditioning for TV and film down here for four years now, and it helps to just physicalize the person even before yeah. I start talking. Just like it doesn't have to be big and broad; it just has to still be present. Like, where does my person? Where does my person? You know, where does their weight fall? Is, does their weight fall to the the front of their of their toes? And what does that mean? What, how does that inform how they go about life? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, do, do they do they sort of like are they are they very symmetrical? Are they lopsided? Are they, you know, like if you just start to make these very physical, just only physical choices about your character, you're already three steps ahead. Yeah. Because you've you've given them a past. Our entire history exists in our body. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and whether we like it or not, we that's what that's what we emulate first, and that's what people receive from us first. It's like oh. Somebody that walks with a, a a bit of a strain, you know, they've had a quite a very different life than somebody who's like, yes, yeah. Like, right. you know what I mean? Well, it, it's weird because it seems like such basic stuff, but at the same time, it's like a, people take it for granted. I think a lot of actors yeah. take that. Oh, of course I'm doing that. And it's like, no, no, no. There's a training around this. If, if and I'm so it sounds like you were super, super fortunate being in the right place in the right time with the right talent. To have the chance to to explore that so specifically, which is why I call it serendipitous. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I, I was not looking for it. I didn't need it, or at least didn't think I needed it, and it just landed on my lap. And it's what has shaped my my entire you know approach to to this art craft. Mm. Yeah. And so, when you were in London, did you guys have it? Did you go see a lot of shows? We tried, but. It was it was such a, such a, an incubated program that it was it was a challenge. I mean, we were we were at the studio pretty much all day because mm -hmm. we, we we would get a prompt at the beginning of the week, and by that Friday we had to have a performance created, done, ready to ready to go, and then the performance would then get shredded to pieces or uh, you know or advanced or you know yeah. But there's nothing more uh, um, humbling than being in the middle of this performance. You think it's awesome, and then, the, then somebody goes, "No, no, 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 no! Stop! 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 <laughs> stop! 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 Stop!" stop. Yeah. And you're like, "But it's so brilliant. We spent five days like making this incredible thing, and you're telling us it's shite." Um, but then they go and tell you why it's shite, and you're like, "Oh, okay, yeah, I can see why." Yeah right. right. Yeah it's right. Either indulgent or it's it's not story focused or you know what like then you start to sort of like go how do I get my mind around this idea and is it a self indulgent idea or is it an actually an idea that can be shared right and you sort mm -hmm. of start to assess those those different things. Uh, so did you did you uh, go from that program? Did you start looking for teaching gigs or did you go since you had the masters? Did you go? Well, I can do either of these. Were you auditioning? And and when you came back to the states, where did you come back to? 
One of my favorite memories of this training was we were rolling around on the floor, I think acting like babies, right? Mm -hmm. Some exercise that we were doing. And I locked eyes with with one of my my cohorts and I'm like, we're getting a master's in this? <laughs> and then he goes, yep. And then we just kept rolling around, right? But that kind of triggered this sort of fear of what am I going to do with this strange masters, right? Which in Europe, it's pretty common to have physical theater training. But at the time, coming back to the States with physical theater training was was not necessarily the, mo the most heard of uh, experience, right? It was just like mm -hmm. focus on your Shakespeare, focus on your text and, and tell the story. Or at least that was my impression at the time. So the fear came of like, what am I going to do with this master's? And then what am I going to do? And, to start with, and then, and then ca that kind of infected the rest of my, my cohorts. And so we all started to freak out during the last two months of our training as we are working on our mm -hmm. thesis. And, you know. Yeah. Um, and then I get a call from a friend of mine in Denver who says there's an opening for a job that she where she works at. And she was doing educational theater for children through Kaiser Permanente. Ah, oh, Kaiser. Yes, exactly, right? So it seemed like everything aligned for me. I'm like, I want to teach, I want to do theater, and, and I want to make an impact. So those three things just like was a perfect match for, for that program, right? And so the caveat was that they, had, they were gonna have auditions in a week and I was still a month away from finishing my program in, in London, right? Mm -hmm. I was in the middle of my of my final thesis. And so I was like, all right, are they willing to see me over over tape? So at the time there was no Skype or this thing yeah. that we now at the time it was like you send a tape and hopefully it'll get <laughs> there, <right? laughs> and so then yes they they interviewed me over the phone I came highly recommended by her because she was one of my my uh, my cohorts in undergrad, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and then they asked me to put myself on tape. They sent me the script, put myself on tape, and I send it. And then I hear back saying we cannot view this tape because it was recorded in oh in P E S P A L or whatever it is P -A -L format. And so then I had to completely reshoot it, <sighs> send it to them in the midst and like a week before my final presentation. Uh, and then I put it in the mail and two days later say, we're able to see it. The, the first uh, first tape that I sent, they were they found, oh. found a way to adapt Transfer, it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then I finish my training and then I get a call, again, an email saying that I, that I was accepted. So mm -hmm. now, all stress goes away because now I know that I have a job to go back to when I get back to Denver. That's wonderful. Uh, now, mind you, when I went to London, I went with an open ticket. I wasn't sure if I was going to come back to Denver, right? Uh, oh, really? I, I was open to go wherever wherever this experience would take me. I was just like, we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, but then I found out that if I left the States for more than a year, that would forfeit my residency, my legal residency. Right. That makes sense. And make me un, uh, not eligible for citizenship eventually, right? So right. I was just under the 12, year, 12 month mark. So I, I went back to Denver just so that I wouldn't I wouldn't lose that. You, yeah, lose your place and, in the queue. Yeah, exactly. And so, but thankfully, you know, I had a job to go back to, and it was it was incredible. It was it, it was a great a great first year. The program in Denver paid us over the summer, oh. which was great. Um, so then that summer, I went back to Italy and studied mask making under a master mask maker. Wow. Donato Sartori. I studied in his own backyard and mm -hmm. learned his craft, um, which then, you know, I made masks for the for the mind troop later on. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, and so then I went back and then the second year, I was having some relation relationship issues and I just didn't want to be in Denver anymore. And so yeah. I just, I put it out there to the universe. I'm like, what's next? Where am I going next? Right. And I started 
seeing images of San Francisco pop up left and right, including the San Francisco Mime Troupe, right? Mm -hmm. Which at the time, I didn't know that San Francisco Mime Troupe was a a political theater company. I just thought it was a mime troupe. And I'm like, oh, I, I've done mime. That was mm -hmm. aligned with me. Um, and so anyway, so that was like, that would be part of my goal is to, to, to sort of to see the mime troupe and to maybe get get connected with them uh, when I when I go to San Francisco. So all these images sort of started popping up San Francisco, San Francisco, there's movies, all this. And so I, as I said, there must be some sort of omen. And then I see mm. it. A notification for for um, an opening of the Kaiser in Oakland. Right. right. Yeah. And which show? Just out of curiosity, which show were you doing with? Uh, for those people who don't know, Kaiser Permanente does these huge all over the country uh, school tours of shows about health and about puberty and about drugs and about you know just all of these different things to help students and kids get through different health issues in their lives so and i did doctor uh, professor body wise's traveling menagerie <laughs> so I was, and, you know right before i was with the mind troop that was my right previous gig and it was great physical training and character stuff but i know they had other shows which one were you doing well in denver we actually did body wise even though it oh you did body wise because they stopped doing it out here yeah it was retired it was retired and 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 in the Bay Area long before it was in Denver. So I oh, definitely did Body Wise in Denver. And then I did a show called What Would You Do, which the, the students would get to choose our adventure. So oh, wow. it was a bullying show where at a certain points in the story, we would stop the scene and we would point to somebody and say, what would you do here? And then we would try oh. out that idea. It was very Augusto Boal type of. Yeah, I was it thinking it's very Boal, very living stage from DC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so huh. that was that was amazing, um, and then we also did a, a teen program where we would go to a school, work with a small group of teens. They would build a show that then they would tour to middle schools. So oh it, wow! Or peer teaching, but we were more of the directors and the facilitators of the program. So that was pretty. Uh -huh. cool. And then when I moved to to um, Oakland. I was the first cast that created the show called The Best Me. This mm, show mm -hmm. focused on active living and healthy eating. And each character had like a particular, you know, issue, like too much mm. sugar or watching too much TV or not being able to go outside, things like that. And through some fantasy character that they created in their mind, they would find ways to still to learn either about healthy or to still do the things they want to do in a healthy way. Um, wow. So I, I played this Mexican kid who loved soccer, but also loved sugar. So he has he has a sugar crush in the middle of, of his soccer tryouts and, and and doesn't make it. So then in his demise, he creates this character called Sano, the surfer dude, who's like totally adventurous, so you can do anything. Um, oh no, sorry, no. Uh, no, 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 no. Sano was for the other guy. Uh, for me, it was Kayla, who who was Miss, like, a water girl. So she would talk all about water and teach me about how amazing water is. And so she inspires my character to drink more water, and that eventually makes a soccer team. Oh, cool. So, yeah, cute little story. Just like uh, life. The, the Sano was the character that appeared for the guy who watched too much TV. Mm -hmm. So, so he, he was at home watching TV. And so Sana comes out like, well, you can still, you can live all those adventures on TV, but for yourself kind of thing. And so, you know, that can. Oh, yeah, no, that's cool. Um, and then eventually so I moved on to play the male understudy for the company. So uh -huh. all the male roles and all the different tiered programs. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. And, and the community troupe after that, which was more. Uh, just simply catering specific smaller programming for the community at large as opposed to just schools. Mm -hmm. uh, and that included a lot of mascot work. So I really so the characters from Body Wise became mascots at Kaiser. Huh. Right? And so okay. then those, see that got the costumes. Yeah, exactly. So those mascots would go out to to community events and we would just sort of either hand out uh, those step step counters or handout information mm. and 
or just take photo ops with the kids and sort of have an opportunity for our handlers to teach them about whatever our character stood for. Um, so that was pretty cool. But then once I hit 30, I started feeling like I was too old for it now. You know, How many like, years did you do it? Almost 10, including, wow. including Colorado. So yeah, so I did it for almost 10 years. That's, that's a lot of body wise. Yeah. <laughs> and also artistically, I was yearning for something more, right? I was mm -hmm. I really wanted to do more theater. And um, so that I, I think in 2013, I finally left Kaiser. Mm -hmm. And just started freelancing in the Bay Area. That's when I did my first general general audition at the bay area which was frightening af oh yeah really <laughs> um, but I, I i ended up doing some mime work which totally made me stand out i, I believe at the time mm -hmm. um, so I, I did a monologue from shakespeare and then at the end of it i had a letter and then the letter just got stuck in the air and i couldn't i couldn't and i was just like excuse myself from the audio from the stage and the freaking letter wouldn't leave i'm and, trying to remember if i saw that i'm i don't know <coughs> but it's kind of ringing a bell i think i think keiko saw it yeah if i'm mistaken i think i think she was the one that was talking about it um and yeah and so then that's when i really started more seriously looking at what the mime troupe was doing because before that i was just a regular fourth of july um, audience member for the mime troupe, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So then, then I really, but seeing the caliber of work that you guys were doing, I didn't feel myself worthy of it. So I never auditioned for it or thought that I could stand, stand my own ground. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, and so then when, when, when I was asked to do masks for you guys, I said, oh, this would be a great way for them to just get to know me. Right. Right. So, though I had to completely like rearrange my living room so I can make these masks, I oh, yeah. I committed to it and I did it and hopefully. Now, which show was that that you were making masks on? Twenty twelve, the musical. Oh, sorry, what? Twenty twelve, the musical. Oh, in twenty twelve. Oh God, yes. Yes. Oh, so you made my mask? Yeah. Oh. And your Obama mask. I made that. Right. Yeah, that's right. I do. I remember you were coming in. And they're like, oh, this guy, he's this great mask maker. I was so focused on writing the show that when I'm writing and acting, I'm just like, like yeah. this. You know? <laughs> um, I just remember like the, having to make testicles for a chin. <laughs> yeah, that was for Victor's character, Victor. right? Because <laughs> his nose was very penis-like, so then we have to make his chin look like testicles. And that was like, right. all right. I'm yeah, so for, a for the... For the millions who did not see that show <laughs> the show was about a theater company that is super radical and does really radical avant-garde weird plays about you know really tough things and they're struggling with getting uh grant money from the government or from big corporations or from foundations they don't want to take money from corporations so they take money from a foundation which it turns out in the end is controlled by this foundation and is going to use the company to basically become a, a conduit for their particular type of propaganda. And at the beginning of the show, there was this, uh, this section which was about Barack Obama stabbing uh, the working class in the back, <laughs> literally, with a character called Working Class Man. And it was all written in iambic pentameter, and it was super stylized. And when we opened the show, I mainly remember that there, there was this stunned silence through the crowd of hope that this wasn't going to be the real show. They're just like, oh, God, I hope it's not all like this. And then at the end, we do that scene. It's like the first five minutes of the show. And, you know, working class man comes back to life and he just uh, dispatches all of the corporate uh, cronies and criminals. And Obama is like, will you ever forgive me? And he's like, no, you stabbed me in the back, but you still have a chance to be good to be a good president, then all the actors would come forward and bow because that's the end of that show inside of our show. And the rest of the play is about the next play that they're writing. 
And uh, yeah, and so we had that. So we had actual mask work, which the Mayan troop doesn't normally do, but we used it in that part of the scene. Yeah. So I um, just remembered how how it is that I got connected to you guys is because I did a show at Teatro Vision when I first moved to the Bay Area. It was mm -hmm. Blood Wedding in Spanish, and the director wanted to make every other character but the main characters masked. And so mm -hmm. I was in the show, but they also hired me to make the masks for the for the company, and mm -hmm. Will was the stage manager and so wow. then Wilma was the director of 2012 so she's the one that said let's reach out to this guy and see if he can make the masks for us so that's how that connection sort of happened I was trying to remember how how that came through and it was through Wilma that, huh. that, that I that I became involved and so then in 2013 when I left Kaiser then I finally had the the guts to audition for you guys and I made it um, eh. That's because it, you're so damn talented. <laughs> uh, I remember, I think I sang Piragua from In the Heights mm -hmm. uh, for my audition. I was nervous. I was nervous out of my mind, but you know, it happens. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, auditioning is really nerve wracking, but you know, we try to make it not too hard. But And that was the year but, you, you took a hiatus. Yeah, I took a year off. I can't. Why did I take a year off? Did I leave? Oh, I left the country. I, I went so. to Spain for mm -hmm. to do to work on uh, 1984. Mm -hmm. And so I was around for the auditions, but then I was like, I'm not writing the show this year. I need a break, which I hadn't taken a break in a decade. Yeah. You know, so I was like, I'm taking a break. I'll be back. And you guys did Oil and Water, which looked like a lot of fun. I I saw opening and closing. <laughs> and the rest of the time I was out of the country. It was a blast working with Rotimi. Like, mm -hmm. It was such a blast, such a blast. Ah, good time. Um, yeah, and that's that's what got me hooked on the Mime Troop. Um, yeah, and I mean, once you've... And in that show, because you were, you know, you were so funny, you brought so much to it, there was, you know, it was a smaller cast show for us, and you did so much, and we were like, well, this is somebody we want around. Mm -hmm. You know, this is someone we want in the collective because not only were you smart and talented, but also that you were smart in a non-annoying way, <laughs> which not everyone is. <laughs> and so, so that you would speak your mind without being and, and say, well, we need to talk about these really basic and fundamental, get, fundamental issues without being like condescending or like you didn't come in and try to be the new broom which happens in theater companies where somebody says, oh, you've been doing this. Well, you've been doing it wrong all this time. You came in with fresh eyes, but that didn't mean that, uh, like I said, you weren't like, I'm the voice of the real world. Come to help you people. Yeah, no, I, I, that's never yeah. my dude. <laughs> uh, so, like, you know, when, so when I was really nice. Piazzo, they've been, they've been doing Chicano theater for, for decades. Right. And so mm. then when I, when I came in, I remember like my instinct going that's not the that's not the way spanish is spoken right because the the, the spanish is very pocho or chicano which is kind of like a blend between english and spanish right yeah and i had to like often fight the instinct to try to correct that because i'm like no there's a particular experience that needs to be represented in these plays right in, in the way that they are and so there's a large community of people that speak this way and so therefore these these plays are for them they're not for mm -hmm fluent Spanish speakers necessarily, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so with that, you kind of learn to sort of go into a place, you know, and honor the space that they've created and sort of just add to it as opposed to alter it or change it, you know what I mean? And it was cool also working with you because we got to work with each other. I mean, we only ended up doing two shows. Oh. But one where you co-directed and then one where we were in it together. Uh -huh. So we got to experience, you know, uh, uh, being on stage, you know, looking into each other's eyes and, right. and, and communicating that way. But also me, um, you know, taking notes from you and, and you interpreting, especially in the way you did in, uh, with Ripple Effect, you know, the movement and the puppetry and all of that, that uh, and that particular form of storytelling. So I kind of got to see you in a very brief period of time 
do a lot of stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my, my, my thesis that I keep calling it a thesis. They, they call it a command in, in mm -hmm. my, my, my graduate studies. They call mm -hmm. it a more so than a thesis, but I created a life size puppet for my, for my final presentation. It was manned by two people. And, and that's sort of where my, my, my adoration for puppets sort of came through. So with ripple effect, I'm like, I get to play with puppets. This is amazing. Let's do this. You know, and I'd already been doing a lot of puppet work with Kaiser through, through, right. um, uh, the, the body wise and through, um, ZGD zips great day mm -hmm. puppetry there as well. So. Oh, yeah. yes, puppets. I, I love puppets. They're, they're a lot of fun. And they work great. I mean, it's, you know, uh, I always feel like even an evil puppet, even a full body evil puppet still has this sense of um, the audience loves that just slightly grander than human. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a, a world where that's possible and a yeah. world that's at that scale. And it's easier to frighten them, but it's also easier for them to fall in love. Like in Ripple Effect, just having those two big puppets that were faces right. as the parents. And the audience totally bought into it. Oh, those are the parents. And they're huge compared to Keiko's character, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and who's struggling to, you know, as, a, as a, uh, an immigrant coming over uh, after uh, the Vietnam War. And they just, they had this sense of the audience sucks, gets sucked into the world of puppetry because it's it's on some level comforting, even if they're bad, it's still comforting storytelling. Yeah. Um, yeah. So and then we got to work together in, and uh, I remember when I was working on Freedom Land and I was like, OK, who am I? I'm going to write this part for this person. And this and I turned to you and said, can you do the accent of an old Jewish man from New York? <laughs> <laughs> the look on your face, you were just like, you, it wasn't like that. It was just like, hmm, can I? I'll work on that. <laughs> yeah, can I? Hmm. And it, it came out. It came out okay. I mean, hey. Oh yeah, it was great. It was. You were so funny in that <laughs> part, you know. And having to do those quick changes with that guy, you know, right on stage. Where for those who didn't see the show, where you know, uh, Ugo was an undocumented immigrant who was living upstairs from uh, the 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 this other character, uh, who was his friend, who I played, and. He uh, one of the ways that he had stayed under the radar was whenever the police or some authority showed up, he took on this character of Mr. Shulman. I think it was Mr. Shulman, Mr. Yeah. Shulman who loved Pinochle. And he would he would drop into this accent of, hi, how are you doing? And then he would like basically chase the cops off stage by threatening to play Pinochle with them. We can play Pinochle. And they were just like, no, no, God, it's OK. Well, never mind. <laughs> And then he would just drop back into his other character uh, and be able to just go, see, that works, you know. And it really required a very particular physical style and particular kind of comedy that I think was right in your wheelhouse so perfectly. Yeah. You know, to be able to change that body so quickly, to change that. And we see the enjoyment of it. It was wonderful to watch. Yeah, it definitely felt very comfortable in that role, for sure. For sure. And so then after... Uh, after we did that show and we toured it around, um, and then you had to leave because Hollywood was calling, and you I were getting you were like, I and left. you were doing other shows besides Mind Troop shows, really great shows that we would yeah. hear about and go and see, and then it just got to a point in your career where you decided you wanted to try movies and television, and it sounds like that you've been in things. Which is well, the, thing, the thing about my move to LA was not necessarily because I wanted to pursue TV or film. Mm -hmm. TV and film was not necessarily a, a big part of my focus. And though I was doing a little bit of it in the Bay Area, theater was was my my jam, right? Mm -hmm. um, and moving to L.A. was never part of my vision or part of my vision board. But I was in a long distance relationship. And oh, that's right. Yeah, I forgot. We had we had to choose whether she would come to the Bay or me come to L.A. And so ultimately, uh, I end up, ended up coming here. So that's what kind of forced me to shift gears into TV and film because that's the dominant uh, industry here. Right? Right. Oh, um, that's right. I forgot 
forgotten about them. Yeah. Yeah, th th there is theater here in LA, but it's 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 one hard to get into because it's very incubated, and and two, it's just not that great like it is in the Bay Area. <laughs> you know people are going to see this that are from Los Angeles. I know, I know. And I'm probably burning some bridges right now without even knowing. And, and maybe I'm, I'm, I've yet to find the great theater. You know what I mean? Like, I also haven't mm -hmm. explored it that much because I... There are some... I mean, I've, I've seen stuff down there that's really good and, and it is, it's harder for them. Yeah. I know that, you know, it's harder. Like with Actors Gang, they could do some great shows, but each show has to have like three casts always on tap because exactly. at any point right. if somebody gets a commercial or a television show or a movie they're gonna leave yeah and so they you have to be so it, it makes it harder for the theaters to kind of have, have a consistent work they might open a show with a certain cast and mm -hmm. two days later there's you know three understudies going on or they're not even understudies alternate cast members so i think that makes it hard for them and it's, it's also the, hard to make money yeah here in la just because of you know the, the 99 seat contract is pretty typical. Right. Uh, unless you're doing like a one of the two or three Lord theaters, you're not really making money as a theater actor here in LA. That makes uh, it tough. So it must have been super cool for you to uh, come back up and do um, uh, uh, the show Cal Shakes then. Oh, yeah. Like most of the theater that I've done since I moved to LA has been outside of LA. I've gone to Arizona Theater Company, mm. uh, I, I've gone up to the Bay Area. Um, now, now I've been to Boston, I've been to um, uh, Houston, and I've been to uh, Hartford. Um, uh, hopefully, I think Denver is next on my radar. I want to sort of go back mm. to Denver and do theater there. Mm -hmm. uh, I did last year. I went last year and I directed a play at Su Teatro, which is the company that I started with. Uh -huh. I directed a, an original piece about the gentrification that's happening on the north side of Denver. Oh, wow. And that show became really, really popular. It sold out. It sold out the extension. It sold out the next extension. Then they performed it in the north part of Denver at the North High School, and that sold out as well. And then they wow. finally, they did their final performance at one of the parks in North Denver that's, that's featured in the play. Uh, as a free performance to the audience, and they they filled the park. It was wow. pretty popular. Uh, I got best uh, the Broadway World best director for that play. Uh, the play got best um, ensemble, uh, best actor, uh, so many other awards from the, the oh, that's super cool. master, which was which was really cool to that I got to go back and contribute to that company and. And also just like create this amazing show that people just love. Mm -hmm. um, I was slated to go back again this this May to direct for them one of the one of their oldest plays that they that they do. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that is not going to happen. Um, not so much. Not so much. Maybe this year. Maybe next time. Maybe yeah, yeah. Well, what's that show called? The one that you uh, wrote and directed for them. I didn't write it. I, I just directed it. Um, oh, you just directed. What was it called? It, it was written by Bobby Lefebvre, who is now the Poet Laureate for Colorado. Oh, wow. Wow. He's a young man, a, a little bit younger than me, uh, super talented poet. Um, and this is a play that's very personal to him because he lives in the north side and he has seen how gentrification has completely um, transformed his community. Mm -hmm. So this was definitely... I. I I treat I treated it with a lot of care, you know what I mean, because I I know how how personal it is to him and to the community as well. So I so I went with and you know I I I, I took my time with it. You know what I mean? I took mm -hmm. my time to sure that I could one honor it, two that I it was it didn't feel like this outsider coming in and telling their story. And then I, I, as in the process, I come to find out that I'm not an outsider because I grew up there and I personally, I saw the effect because I, I hadn't been to Denver in almost eight years, right? Mm -hmm. And so I go back and my Lyft driver happens to drive me through the north side and I oh. see this like incredible change that happened in that neighborhood. 
And wow. so to, to be hit in the face with it, then that gave me all the motivation to like really to, to tell the story right. And mm -hmm. so um, oh. when, I first, when I first got the script, it didn't feel like his play. And it's one of the first thing I told him, I'm like, I'm not getting your voice in this play at all. And he goes, mm -hmm. what do you mean? And I'm like, well, you're one, you're a poet, right? Um, and you're trying to make a play written by somebody else. And I think this play mm -hmm. needs to be written by you. And that's, mm -hmm. I think that's all I said. And then he comes back to me a week later with this incredible like play, like mixed with poetry, mixed with like so much more. And so then now I can then focus on essentializing the scenes and bring it and, and like, you know, getting down to the nitty gritty. And, and then I challenged him to go, how much of this is a rant versus an actual element of the, of, of the play you want to tell, right? Because he had a rant in it. And so, he's, so then I challenged him to sort of go through and to dissect it and go, okay, how much of this is really just not necessary to the story? Right. And to make it more, more, more to hit the heart of, of what we're trying to get to, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so by the end, we ended up with this beautiful, heartfelt, poetic, physical landscape of, of what's happening. And very funny, like, like the, the two people that I got as my token white people were incredibly funny and very gracious to allow us to to go there with them, you know, because yeah, they, right. actually, they, they would they would be seen by this audience as <laughs> the bad guys, right? All right. Uh, and so it was an interesting dance to work with them on how to make their characters not fake, still true and yet still honor the fact that they are the ones causing the, the problems, right? right? And so they, they, they were totally game and they were, they were so gracious to just go, go with it with us. And, and it paid off because the audience really warmed up to them and really loved them and appreciated their work, you know what I mean? So it was, it was a really nice experience to see that. Like I really, I didn't want to fall into like, pointing fingers or making them the bad guy or making right. them the joke, right? Right. Um, they're part of the funny, they're part of the mix, and we all contribute to the problem one way or another. So how can we look at it that way? So that's, I think that's what made the play like really land. Um, oh, cool. It allowed the community to reflect on themselves um, and then also reflect on, on the changes, which is really cool. Yeah. Mm. So that was, a, that was a really nice experience. Um, and then, so you're kind of you're you're staying very committed to theater, and kind of doing the television and movie stuff, you know, when it pops up. Because those gigs for those people aren't aren't in the business. Those gigs may they have more glamour around them, and they may pay more, but they're normally really short. You know, like you might see somebody every day on a commercial. Um, uh, but they worked one day on that. You see it for maybe a year, a year and a half, or however long that that uh, ad campaign runs. But they did that. That might have been eight hours of their life a couple of years ago, and they're still making money off it. And they're you know they're getting diminishing residuals and stuff. But um, you know it's easy to have someone who you think of it as kind of like part of your your uh, cultural life because you see them all the time on your television. But they really are completely different from that and spend the vast majority of their time doing something else, like with Ugo doing theater. You or know? they're probably not working. What? Or they're probably not working, which or is they're probably problem. Yeah, they're probably not working. They're probably sitting around waiting for the next thing to come up. Or if they're like in New York, there are a lot of actors. Um, I was surprised. Did you know, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Reggie White? Yeah. Yeah, so Reggie White, I went to New York and I saw him do an off-Broadway show. And I was like, this is great. He was doing that Lauren Gunderson show. Mm -hmm. And and I was like, this is so cool. And I saw him like closing day. And I was like, what are you doing next? And he said, well, I've got this other thing. I'm going to be working on it for months. And it's going to be, you know, every uh, six nights a week and doing all this stuff. And I was like, so you're really um, making money here. And he's like, oh, that doesn't pay. And I was like, What? And, and that people think that all of these gigs pay a lot or they're there. You can work on pro, 
basically as an actor, especially in New York, you're investing in a show sometimes. You're investing sweat into the show in hopes that it will someday make it and they will use you. Yeah. You know? But actors spend most of their time sitting around hoping for the next gig and normally working some other job. Uh, and uh, so it's so it's it's not about the glamour. And there's really not the isn't glamour much. is only for a very small percentage of actors. Yeah. Right? Even, even the ones because I, I know some actors who work all the time, but they're you barely know who they are. You know what I mean? Um, right. And that's and that's been an interesting paradigm shift for me where it's it's like, oh, no, no, I'm I'm working to stay working as opposed to I'm working to get famous. I'm not trying to get famous. Right. right? I want to work for the rest of my life. Uh, fame yeah. is fickle. Fame doesn't last that long. You know what I mean? But no, if I, then you, you're in a type mm -hmm. and you can age out of that type. But if you're a character actor and you can play all these characters and do all these uh, voices and do voiceover and do games or do all of this other stuff. And you may not be famous, but it's what you do for a living now. Yeah. You are working. Um, yeah, ever since moving in here, I've moved. I, I've worked on several major shows, but you know that they, they've been one day day players. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Uh, and not to say that's not great. It's it was an amazing experience, and it's been incredible. Um, but that's the bulk of our work here in LA. It's like we are we are day players. We're guest guest players. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. Very few few actors are actually leading and making a lot of money. Like, yeah, I, I, I'll get so, paid for the day, and maybe eventually, if it gets sold, I may get another check here and there. Right? Yeah. Uh, where the money is for somebody at my level is in commercials because the, those will pay. You yeah, know, that's where you will make money for years. But that's just enough to sustain you, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Because, <clears throat> like, like, think about it. Even though I only worked eight hours and I'm making a good chunk of change, there's a, a whole lot of time that I'm not working, and so that money just sort of like pays for that time when I'm not working. Yeah, so kind of. That's just... always the thing with people put down commercials. Actors, you know, when I was in school, I was in college. I actually got cast in a national commercial, and I un ultimately got cut from it, which was really yeah. unfortunate because the people who stayed in it got like seventy-five thousand dollars for the year you know, for like the next three years. But when I was talking to my teachers about it, I was doing a play in college and I said, I'm going to have to miss one tech rehearsal in order to do this commercial. And they said, well, you can't do that. This is a play. And we have to, what about your commitment to your fellow actors? And I said, I'm not quitting the show. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to have to miss one out of five tech rehearsals. And I finally just said, look, this is how I make a living. I need, I have to pay rent. I've got food, you know? Uh, this is commercial subsidize the rest of the work. Yeah, exactly. You know, so it may, it may not be great acting. I just right. had to stand around and smile and kiss somebody, but it yeah. still paid a lot of money. I think one commercial that I did, all I had to do was like point at things. Yeah, and that's right. it. Um, but e even even nowadays, the commercials don't pay as much as as what you just mentioned because now the campaigns run much much shorter. They're much shorter yeah. campaigns, so they don't pay half as much as they used to. Right, right? they're coming so they, up with things like yeah, because uh -huh. I think because of the saturation. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. on television, but it's also on YouTube, it's also on Hulu, it's all over the place, and they go, okay, next campaign. Yeah, the ones that are making the money are the ones that that get the regular commercial repeating the character, the same character in the flow, same, from right? Progressive. Like, oh, from Progressive, or or the guy yeah. from Way, or the guy from. Uh, Sprint, you know Sprint, what I mean? Like, or, yeah. Yeah, and those are very rare. Like, we, we can so name... It can then mess up, like, it can mess up the rest of your career if everybody sees you as that character. I remember seeing a film once, and the woman who plays Flo from Progressive, because she's an improv actor. She's she was in it, but she had to have a wig on. She didn't look like herself. It took me a while to go, oh, that's that same actor. Because if the audience sees her as that person from the commercial, it destroys the film for them. And casting directors a lot of times will just go, nope, sorry, everybody sees you this way. Yeah. So it can be tough. And the tough part is I've seen her perform at Groundlings several times, and she's super talented, and it's got yeah. so, so much range, but Flo only limits her to, like, that much, right? She's right. making good money, right? <laughs> so, yeah. So it, it's tough. So we have a few more minutes left. Uh, 
Uh, so what do you what do you what projects do you have coming up or anything like that? I mean, it's hard now because everybody's <laughs> stuck at home. But is there anything that you were like, I'm a when this is all done, I have some things coming up. I don't have anything lined up, unfortunately. Everything that I had lined up is, has has uh, gone away uh, mm. due, due to the situation. Um, the, like the directing gig in Denver. Oh, right. I had, a, I had a national commercial. I was pinned for it. Now, for those of you that don't know what pinned means, it means like you are like the top two in consideration for to get the role right. But at this point, it's just a matter of logistics uh about getting it right it was yeah. it was due to shoot four days after they closed us down oh so i lost a big chunk of change if i if i had gotten that which was very likely it was like pretty likely that i would gotten it. So mm. that was like ugh, a, a big maybe not here maybe more in my wallet right yeah, right somewhere <laughs> in the Some, torso region. it's in the wallet section uh, uh so that Any one chance hurts. that they'll uh, still do it when now that they're starting to open up some stuff? I have no idea. Because in commercials, the actors are the last and most oh, insignificant right. piece of the puzzle. You know what I mean? So yeah. they won't tell us unless we absolutely need to know. Um, mm. Well, so, hopefully. Yeah, we don't know. But uh, the thing that's keeping me afloat right now is, is that I, I'm teaching. I teach theater online. Oh, for, really? Los McDonald's College. Oh, cool. And I've been teaching for them since I moved to LA. Yeah. So this hasn't been a difficult transition for me. The only difference is that now I have to adjust for my students dealing with situation beyond their control. You know what I mean? Like, so I'm more lenient on the due dates and yeah, sort of lightened up the workload so that way they can still handle whatever situation everybody's got going on in their home. Mm. But that's the one thing that's allowing me to pay my bills right now is that I have that. And so, like you were saying, so the master's degree thing really paid off. It's finally paying off, yes. It's allowing yeah. me to have the flexibility that I need to be an actor in L.A. because I'm working online so I can work from anywhere, right? Mm, uh, right. So, yes, so it's definitely <laughs> full circle. It's finally paying off that I'm able to to teach in the craft that I focused on with the flexibility that I need to continue pursuing the craft that I want to pursue, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so now I can go and do theater out of state and still bring my computer with me and continue teaching, right? I can, That's true. I can go to an, an audition and grade papers when I get back, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so it, it's, it's the perfect side job for me. Yeah, uh, at this great. Point. It's really phenomenal. I'm sure that I mean they wouldn't do that for everyone, you know. Every every teacher they yeah. have to do it for the people who they're like. Well, this someone has got a unique set of skills here, and yeah. we want to do what we have to to make it work for them. And I definitely so, feel appreciated. My, like my 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 boss definitely, like he he stepped up. Like when I when I told him I was leaving to LA, he's like, "Well, we're not losing you. Let's keep let's see if we can keep you online." So mm. he, had me, he had me co-teach the first semester that I was here online mm -hmm. to that. He's like, all right, here's two classes, here's three classes. One day, he, one semester he gave me four. I was like, oh. <gasps> wow. <laughs> that was a big load. But I handled it. I handled it like a, like a rock star. Yes. And, um, <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, that's the one thing I'm, I'm grateful to have. And every day I'm just so thankful that, that that's available to me. And I'm going to enjoy it for as long as I'm able to enjoy it. You know what I mean? Um, cool. Yeah. Okay, well, I certainly learned a lot about you. Um, <laughs> and so uh, thanks a lot for uh, for letting me interview you. And um, hopefully we will be able to, I'm hoping, and I'm always trying to find some way to, to, to get you to, to find, have the space so that you can come up and work with the Mind Troop again. So we will continue to try to put out those options for you so that at any point, or if any point you're like, I've got some time off, let us know. Of course, yeah. We'd I mean, love to have you back. It was great working with you. The time trip is always in my radar. It's always going to be there. Like it's, it's embedded. It's like tattooed right there. You know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, well, we do do that every time a new person comes in. If, so. if my mother wouldn't disown me for having a tattoo, I probably would tattoo it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so how is she doing? Is she still... Uh, 
how she, you know, as your career has continued and you've traveled around, is she just puffed up with pride? Oh yeah, she's pretty proud. She she's she's gone. She went to to Hartford to see Quixote Nuevo there. She went to oh, wow. Arizona to see it there. She traveled. She's traveled to the Bay to see some plays that I've done there as well. So it, yeah, she'll she'll make the time. She'll definitely make it. And if I'm on TV, it's much easier because she doesn't have to travel. You know, so yeah, but that's still, that's that is super cool. Yeah, I think one major part that I didn't talk about was Quixote Nuevo and how that oh, yeah. that has had a major. It's been a major part of my life the last two years. Yeah, that's I started at Cal Shands. I originated the role of Papa Calaca, and then that. And you were great. In it. What was that? And you were great in it. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I guess I really wanted to hear that. Um, and so then, that director was brought on to direct a show in the East Coast, and she invited us, some of the original cast members from Cal Shakes to go do that project. And that project was a three company co-production. It was Hartford Stage, that's where we rehearsed it and, and, and opened it up. Then we traveled to Boston, then we traveled to Houston and finished off at at, um, at, at the, alley. Yeah, the Alley Theater. And I gotta tell you, that's been among the top theater experiences for me, just in terms of bringing theater for Latinos, by Latinos, to a larger stage, telling a Latino mm -hmm. story, a, a Chicano story even more specifically, on a larger scale. I don't think we've, I don't think we've seen that since probably Zoot Suit. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. Yeah. the fact that it's gotten so much recognition that now the play is, is moving on to other companies and it's hopefully going to make, make, it, make its rounds around the country. This particular production, we're, we're done. We're, we're not necessarily slated to continue with it, but mm -hmm. I'm very happy that I got to be a part of originating the role of Papakalaka and, and working with one of my heroes, which is Emilio Delgado, who played Luis on Sesame Street. Right. To get yeah. warm next to the man that was my pseudo babysitter when I was a kid, when I was barely learning English, you know what I mean? It was incredible. Um, yeah, highlight. he's such an icon to so yeah. many people, such and it's so important. And yeah, when I when I saw the show here, and I was like, oh my god, yeah. you know, uh, and that, uh, yeah. So like you're saying, for you to have a chance to to be with him for so long, because you <laughs> and, you know doing the show at all these different at four different theaters ultimately, yeah. and really getting to know him to learn from somebody who's made their living doing this for so long and has meant so much to people. Mm -hmm. And and to be inspired by somebody who is was so humble and so just loving and giving and, and very kind and super generous. And that's the type of actor that I want to stay, you know what I mean? No matter what, where I go in my career, I want to stay humble. I want to stay, you know, giving and open and, and just collaborative. That's, that's my thing. Collaboration. Cool. Oh, great. Well, then that's also good to know. So we'll have a time where we can collaborate on something. Yes, please. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Well, I think that we should probably wrap it up. Um, not that I mean, we could continue to talk for quite some time, but, you know, and maybe at some point, you know, some of these, I mean, doing these interviews and I might actually go back and talk to people again, Yeah. you know, about other things that come up so we can dive more deeply into very particular things, like maybe just about the training. Mm -hmm. you know and stuff like that to see how that helps shape you as an artist because that's such a big deal but in the meantime i guess we should wrap up this uh episode of the mime cast and uh thank uh, ugo for taking time out of his schedule and his teaching schedule at this point um to uh to talk to me and um see you guys next time all right bye -bye. thank you so much